All right, thank you, John. Um, so my name is Lauren Bonsbach, and I'll be introducing our speaker tonight, Nora Ventrella. So Nora has been the botanist for the Navajo Natural Heritage Program with the Navajo Nation Department of Fish and Wildlife for the past six years. As part of this program, she collects, manages, and disseminates information on threatened and endangered plant species on Navajo lands and is the curator of the Navajo Nation Herbarium located in Flagstaff. Nora has her master's degree in plant biology and conservation from the joint program between Northwestern University and the Chicago Botanic Garden. Her research background focused on Colorado plateau flora, invasive species, local adaptation, and seed sourcing for restoration. So thank you so much, Nora, for joining us tonight. And we're excited to hear about rare plants and conservation. So shall we uh, yeah. point up? Awesome. Okay, thanks everyone for coming out on a Friday, very snowy and icy Friday evening to learn about rare and restoration plants of the Navajo Nation and some of the other act, uh, conservation activities that uh, the Navajo Natural Heritage Program is working on, including a really cool program called the Net Native Plants Program. Nora, if you want me to get the lights and do something with the lighting here, the one up to you if you can see, yeah, or can up see. to you. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Awesome. So, so a little bit of background about where the Heritage Program is. Um, so Navajo Department of Fish and Wildlife is uh, a tribal department under the Division of Natural Resources. Um, and the mission of Fish and Wildlife is to conserve, protect, enhance, and restore Navajo Nation's fish, wildlife, and plants through aggressive management programs for the spiritual, cultural, and material benefit of present and future generations of the Navajo Nation. So, so yeah, a, a, a wildlife focus uh, within the department. And then the heritage program um, is the only tribal, tribally run uh, heritage program. Um, and it's, it's the endangered species program under Department of Fish and Wildlife. So our program is, is focused on uh, rare and endangered species. Um, and then a little bit of background about where the Navajo Nation is. Uh, so you can see it's roughly a third of the Colorado Plateau, uh, making up three states. You've got Arizona, New Mexico, and then a tiny little bit of Southern Utah. Um, and then, you know, right on the border with Colorado. Um, so 27,000 square miles, um, a pretty large part of the, the plateau. Um, and so because we have such a huge area uh, spanning three states and, and quite a bit of elevation gradient, uh, there's a ton of rare plants and really diverse habitat. So for example, you know, there's, there's high elevation sites like in the Chuska Mountains where we have things like Gooding's Onion, um, which grows in, in uh, big spruce conifer forests. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of, of really cool uh, hanging garden species. So these are species that are found in, in wet seeps and canyons. Um, there's dune, dune species. So this is Welsh's milkweed, uh, which is was federally uh, listed. And that grows in really active moving dunes in Tuba City and Kayenta. Um, and then there, there's a whole bunch of marble, marble Canyon endemic. So these are species that really only grow on the edge of Marble Canyon. Um, and so that this one is uh, Marble Canyon milk bitch. Um, it grows right on the edge overlooking the Colorado River. So it's a really cool plant. Um, Zuni fleabane, also found in the Chuska Mountains. Um, that one grows on like 90 degree slopes in Chinle formation. So it's a really hard one to survey for because you're kind of walking up and down these, these huge cliff faces. Um, and then uh, Navajo Pensamen, a really cool plant. It's endemic to upper Ponderosa forests of uh, Navajo Mountain. Um, so really cool <laughs> endemic. Okay, so, so what do I do for, for Navajo Nation? Um, I do the, the rare plant monitoring and conservation for, for the program. Um, and then I'm also curator of the Navajo Nation Herbarium. Um, and, and I think we have around 14,000 specimens uh, and we're based inside Deaver Herbarium at, at NAU and Flagstaff. Um, and then recently I've done a, a ton of environmental reviews. So this is you know, where our department reviews project development projects that are proposed for Navajo. 
um, and just making sure that we can avoid as many impacts as possible to, to threaten and rare species. So a lot of that. <laughs> How do I, just go ahead and click on that. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So, so what species are we looking at? Um, and so, because Navajo Nation is a, a, a sovereign tribal nation, uh, we actually have our own Navajo Endangered Species list, um, which functions, uh, you know, very similarly to to a lot of the state lists. Um, so basically, we have a groups of species that are designated um, under the species list. So, so group one species are ones that don't occur, no longer occur on the Navajo Nation. So they've been extirpated. Um, an example of that would be black-footed ferret, which I think the last record of that one was from sometime in the 1930s. Um, and then you've got group two and group three endangered species. So these are uh, group two would be uh, the sort of the endangered categories. Um, and then group three is more of the threatened category. Um, and then group four is kind of interesting. That, that's sort of like our watch list. So these are species that we really just don't know enough information about. Um, so they're they're kind of like our sensitive species list. So so plants that we're, we're um, actively collecting data on. Okay, so, so what are some of the monitoring that we do for, for some of these species? Um, and so I'm gonna talk about sort of two different approaches that we use. So the first is uh, like a more of a quantitative monitoring approach. Um, and so we're using this approach for, for really high priority species. So species that are on that like G2 or G3 list, but also uh, culturally important species. So things like um, golden eagle, which is really culturally important for, for the tribe. Um, and so, so really for these species, we'll actually have like, um, like plots set up with, and sometimes each individual within the plot is tagged. Um, and then a botanist will go out every year around the same time and collect data on that population. Um, and so pros of this approach is that you get really high quality data. Um, so you can, you can track things like plant survival, recruitment, so like how many seedlings are popping up every year. Uh, uh, reproductive effort, how many plants are, are reproducing. Um, and it gets you, it gives you really good data for, for figuring out um, uh, population trends from year to year. Um, but the cons of this is, is really there's only one of me and, and maybe a few people that are willing to help out. Um, and it takes a ton of time. So it takes a lot of field time and then a ton of time in the office just tracking and managing data. Um, and then another thing that's really crucial is this, this has to happen at, at pretty much the exact same time every year so that you can compare results uh, from year to year. Um, and then for some of the species, we only have like one or two monitoring sites and they might be located like all in the Northern part of the range or all in the Southern part of the range. Um, so, so for some of them, you don't have like a great spatial representation of like the species as a whole. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Whenever someone chats or asks a QA, the Zoom pops down and everybody's like, what's with the gray bar? Well, it's, well, you're asking questions. So it's popping up. Uh, okay. There it is. <laughs> okay. So, so two examples of this quantitative monitoring approach. Um, the first is a Mesa Verde cactus study that we did last spring. Um, and this was a really cool sort of range wide survey. And then the second one is a Mancus milk vetch survey, um, or sorry, the, a demography monitoring uh, study that was set up in 2019. Um, and then I picked both these species because they do extend into Colorado. So there's um, both of these species go up into Ute Mountain Ute land. Okay, so Mesa Verde cactus, uh, Sclerocactus Mesa Verde. Uh, so this is a species that's found in the Four Corners area, so kind of right near Shiprock Farmington area. Um, and you can see, you know, so there's a little bit of the range goes up into Colorado um, on Ute Mountain Ute. Um, it looks a lot like some of the other sclerocactus out there, um, except that it's missing uh, like a hooked central spine. Um, the flowers are yellow, cream to pink, and then it's a, it's a spring flowering species, so it's, it's flowering late April to May. 
Um, this, this one has a pretty narrow range. Most, most of the plants are found on the Navajo Nation. We have about 70% of the population, um, with some occurring on BLM and private and then Ute Mountain, Ute Land. Um, and you can see sort of the habitat for Mesa Verde. I don't know if I can point, maybe not. Um, it's basically uh, like make a shale badland. So, you know, very little other vegetation growing out there. What What is growing is really low, sort of low growing. Um, so it's often, you know, one of the only plants out there. Uh, what makes it really hard to survey for is that it's pretty sporadic and like widely scattered throughout the habitat. Um, so you have to do a ton of walking to figure out where the plants are. Um, and so uh, with it's it's federally listed uh, as threatened within the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we consider it endangered G2, and then New Mexico also lists it as endangered. Okay, so what was our status assessment survey all about? Um, so this happened last spring, funded by a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service tribal wildlife grant. Um, and basically what we wanted to do is we had all this great data from the 2004 assessment uh, by, by a contractor named Ladyman. And basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to see, you know, can we go back out there to the same exact places and compare our results from the 2004 results? Um, and then we wanted to, to figure out, you know, how many plants were actually out there within these five conservation areas. Um, so these are set up uh, in 2004 to, to protect the cactus from development. Um, but we don't have great data on, you know, are these, are these cactus conservation areas like located in places where they should be so that they're best protecting cactus. Um, so that was another one of our, our objectives of this study. Um, and then because we know uh, several groups are interested in doing a, a species distribution model for the species. So kind of figuring out um, uh, better mapping on, on where the species is likely to occur. Uh, we wanted to collect uh, detailed habitat data like you know, associated species, soil type, topography, slope, that could be fed into a distribution model. So you could figure out you know, um, where, where the species is, is going to occur. Okay, so so yeah, this happened last April. Um, it was really fun for me because I'm usually, you know, maybe there's like one or two of us out there, but um, for this study, we had like six or seven botanists uh, all working at once. Um, and we were able to visit 106 of the, those Ladyman waypoints. Um, and we really expand across the range of Mesa Verde. Um, so there were a lot of points up near Shiprock area, but then we also went to, to sort of a Southern population near Sanosti, New Mexico. Um, and so these were all places where at least one live Mesa Verde cactus was found in 2004. So I won't go too much into the, the like detailed methodology, but basically um, we figured out from, from doing the, you know, trying to repeat this 2004 survey that really there wasn't great data on, on their methods. Um, so it was actually pretty difficult to, to directly compare results. Um, so for our survey, we, we were like, okay, we're going to use a really, a really detailed GPS, like a submeter GPS point, so that future people can go back to the exact same spot um, and know that, you know, they're, they're in the right place. Um, so basically, we collected a bunch of data. We looked at, we took a bunch of waypoints. Uh, we collected data on the number of live and dead stems that we found, stem diameters, condition, and then a bunch of associated um, uh, habitat uh, data so that we could feed into that species distribution model in the future. Awesome. So what did we find? Um, so you can see in the map, kind of, I think, oh, on your left-hand side, uh, the pink areas, those five pink areas are the five cactus conservation areas. So those were set up sort of as, as uh, cactus preserves on Navajo. And then the green waypoints are the 104 Ladyman points that we revisited. Um, and then you can see in, the, in this uh, figure on the left, um, you've got latitude on the, on the y-axis and longitude on the, the x-axis. 
Um, and so basically the position of the dots kind of corresponds to the position of the waypoints on the map. Um, and you can see, you know, in that north northwestern corner, um, plants are doing pretty well. So you have, you know, positive growth from 2004 to, to 2022. Um, whereas, you know, some of these other populations, like uh, the southernmost population near Sanosti, um, we're seeing some, some negative trends there. So if we're thinking about maybe um, adding additional conservation areas, um, maybe choosing that, that Southern Sanofsi population would, would be a really good place to, to put one. Okay, so, so what do we find? Is this good news for Mesa Verde cactus? Um, so in 2004, they found 943 live stems. Um, and then in two, 2022, we found 1,556 stems. So we're finding a net positive of 613 stems. So it seems like there's more plants out there across the landscape. Um, and then we also found way less dead stems. So we, we found 172 less dead stems. Um, and so, so when we're thinking about, you know, what factors could possibly be explaining this result, um, I, I think for, for a lot of people who study plants, uh, uh, the obvious place to go is, is to look at the weather data. Uh, so this is total precipitation um, on an annual basis uh, pulled from uh, Farmington, New Mexico's weather station. Um, and you can see, so in the 2003-2004 survey, uh, where that first um, asterisk is, I wish I had a pointer. <laughs> um, so you can see, you know, they had a pretty above average rainfall year for that that season. So that was a that was a good amount of precip out there. Um, versus, you know, in 2021, 22, we had a much like a super below average rainfall year. Um, oh, there we go. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so here's where our survey was, and this is the 2003-2004 survey. Um, and, and actually, you know, the, the past five years have all been really below average. So, you know, that, that area of the world is experiencing quite a bit of drought. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in 2001, 2002, there was also this really below average rainfall year. Um, and so when the authors were, were comparing their results in 2004 from really old, like historic data from the 1990s, um, they they said, oh, we're seeing all these population crashes because of this drought in 2001, 2002. But you know, we're seeing more more cactus than they did um, in the 2004 survey, and we've got five years of drought behind us. So so that tells me that maybe Mesa Verde cactus is actually more resilient to drought conditions than than previous botanists have thought. So so good news, possibly. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, this is another plant that's found in that core. Yeah. Just a quick question. Yep. Do you think there could be some systemic, systemic error in the number of people you had in the field this time versus 2004 that could account for more? Yeah, no, we, we matched the, the number. We matched the survey effort. So the same number of people over the same amount of hours in the field. Okay, and is that cactus a mantle shale obligate? Is that the only place you find it? So yeah, so yes, it's mancus shell obligate, but then on southern populations, it also grows in um, the uh, blue shell is also on the perfect blue, over on the east side of the hogback. Then if you go down to the southern part, way down by uh, south of Newcomb on into like the uh, Mas Chidi area, grows at the Tehachapi formation. Hmm. Awesome. But but it's it's kind of odd because in certain areas you'll find them on the uh, like the glacial outwash gravels. Oh really? Then you'll also find them in like in really small pockets on like where there's like absolutely no vegetation. I have like a an area about a quarter of the size of this room, and you'll find like 10, 10 individuals there. You know. So I, I think uh, a lot more field needs to be done in order to actually determine its range. You know. mm -hmm. Because if you go like right next to the uh, the southern part of the hogback, and when you get close to the uh, the, uh, the truckle wash, 
There's also a, a population there in the valley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but then, then once you get south of the Red Valley, we're all the way down to Newcomb. There's nothing until you get back to the Sonsi area. So it's really a disjunct population. Very widely separated. Yeah. The southern population are, are it's very interesting because it grows on desert pavement and it also grows in uh, like uh alkaline sacatone grass and swells. And then uh, and then you then you find it in like uh shad scale and totally what totally what you want to think of as having that up more. Huh. Yeah, the thought for, for the southern population is it's actually rooted in Manka Shale underneath, I think it's the Menifee formation that's on top. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, okay, so back to Manka's milk fetch. Um, so yeah, similar part of the world. We're talking Four Corners area. Also goes up into Ute Mountain Ute land. Um, and, and the astragalus, astragalus are pretty cool. There's seven species within the genus that are actually listed on our um, Navajo native species list. Um, so it's a pretty, it's cool, it's a diverse genus. A lot of them are super specialized to, to really specific habitat. Um, so this is this is a little guy, it's, it's perennial mat forming, uh, big, huge purple flowers, uh, spring flowering, late April, early May. Um, and it, you can see here, it kind of grows, oh boy, uh, it grows in uh, cracks in sandstone, uh, so in uh, rim rock and point lookout uh, cliff house sandstones, um, and uh, and it's also federally listed. It's a, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service endangered species. Uh, we have it listed as endangered G2, and then it's also a New Mexico endangered plant. So a lot of conservation interest in this one. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the demography monitoring that we do for this one. Um, and uh, so, so this was one where, where we wanted to get really good representation of, of the whole species across the range. Um, so in 2019, we set up five, we sort of picked five sites within Navajo Nation um, with the, you know, with the um, intention of having a northern population represented, a southern population represented, and some of these like central populations represented as well. Um, and so within those five sites, we set up 21 permanent plots. Um, and then this is an interesting species. So, so it grows, you know, it can either grow in these sandstone cracks um, or it can grow in the, these tanahas or potholes. Um, so we wanted to have, you know, with each of those representing a plot type, we wanted to have a really good mix of the of those two different plot plot styles. Um, and then because you know, you know, within this pothole, you could have uh, like ten individuals, but then over time, sometimes they'll like grow together into like one big clump. And so counting individuals for the species is really difficult. Um, and so how, how we've gone around that is just to do like a, a percent cover estimate. So we'll take like two diameter measurements and then have like an estimation of percent live. Um, and that will give you like percent cover over time. Um, and then we just count the number of seedlings too that we see. Okay, so, so here's what the seedlings look like. They're pretty tiny little guys. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the plant itself is pretty small too. This is, this is a penny right here for reference. Um, so, so this species we know really does respond um, for germination to, to moisture. Um, and so, so it's not surprising, you know, in 2019, we went out and we counted a whole lot more seedlings at pretty much all of the sites. Um, except for interestingly, this long point site, we counted zero seedlings both years. Um, so something might be going on with, with that site. Um, and of course, this corresponds to moisture. So, so you, this is winter precip from the Farmington Weather Station. And you've got a lot more precip in, in 2019 than in 2022. Um, so we have an expected you know, response of seedlings to, to that moisture. Uh, but interestingly, if you look at just aggregate live cover, so just the, the um, summed tally of live cover within the plots, uh, you know, you don't see that that a, a big difference between the years, and you don't see like a big die off of adults in 2022. Um, so maybe so 
so you know that's good news that that maybe these adults are not responding um, in the same way that that seedlings are to to drought conditions. Okay, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the qualitative monitoring approaches we use for for a bunch of um, some of these uh, uh, Navajo endangered species list plant species. So usually we use this approach for some of the lower priority species. So you know some of those like G three or G four species. Um, so a good example, you know, Gooding's onion, Crabquist milkbitch. Ryberg thistle, which is and uh, Utah bladder fern, both of those are hanging garden species. Um, Alco death camas and clovers cactus. So basically, for these species, um, I'll go out to a site and and we track all of our our rare species population data in our species database. Um, and so I'll go out and I'll do like an estimation of how many plants there are. Uh, what the associated species are and if there's any new threats to the population. So, you know, is there like a new road through the population? Are there a bunch of invasive species? Is there like crazy cattle grazing? Um, all those things are really helpful for, for monitoring. Um, and then, the, you know, cons of this effort is, is really uh, survey effort matters. So how long you're spending at a site and how many people and, you know, how far you walk really matters. Um, and then you're not getting that really detailed demography data. So you're not getting, you know, recruitment, mortality, things like that. Uh, so here's a species that I use this method for. Uh, this is Gooding's onion. Um, again, I think I mentioned that it's found up in the high elevation of the Chuska Mountains. Um, it likes slopes and moist drainage bottoms in spruce fir and mixed conifer forests. Um, this, so this is found on Navajo Nation. It's both in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, and then it's also in New Mexico and Arizona, uh, mostly within the national forest, forest lands. Um, but what's really interesting about this species is that um, it's, it's a really high conservation interest because 95% of the populations have burned in like a series of, of seven wildfires since 2006. Um, so this is a species that a lot of people are looking are looking into, um, and it's also a candidate species uh, for listing uh, under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so it, it's one that we've we've done a lot of work on. Um, and so you can see, you can kind of see here this little faded map, but um, these are our four populations on Navajo. Uh, so this is the the New Mexico Arizona border. Um, and so you can see, you know, one of our populations is, is within Canyon de Chez National Monument. Um, um, and then because we know that this species has burned um, out in all the places, pretty much all the national forests outside of Navajo Nation, uh, we thought it was a really good idea to do ex situ uh, seed collecting. Uh, so in 2019, I went to three out of the four populations um, and then collected seed to, to send to the Arboretum at Flagstaff. And that's basically just to have the material, you know, in case in case some of these populations burn, which you know is pretty pretty likely under climate change in the near future. Okay, so now I'm shifting gears a little bit, and I'll I'll, I'll talk about the Dinet Native Plants Program. So shifting away from from the threatened and rare species. Um, so I'm doing a lot of walking out on Navajo. I'm looking for rare plants, you know, hiking around. Um, and, and basically what I'm seeing is that a lot of the ecosystems out there really need help. Um, and then the primary impact that I'm seeing is, is really from overgrazing. So um, there's, there's two big sources of overgrazing. Uh, the main one is, you know, you've got a ton of wild horses out there. So um, Fish and Wildlife uh, hired a contractor in 2017. Um, and what they did is they they flew these helicopter transects across the entire Navajo Nation and they counted the, the horse groups that they saw. Um, and then so they did a bunch of math and they found that, you know, somewhere between 32 and 53,000 free, free ranging wild horses are out there on the on Navajo. So that's a lot of horses having a lot of impact to uh, waterways, to, to ecosystems, rangelands. Um, yeah, and then the other issue is trespass and unpermitted livestock. Um, and so there's just too many cattle, too many sheep out there. 
Um, and and uh, it, it is BIA, so it's the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, part of their job is to actually adjust permit numbers to, to the appropriate range carrying capacity. Um, but they, they've been reluctant to do that. Um, and so Fish and Wildlife um, has taken over a little bit of that process. Um, and we're currently working with BIA to, to get appropriate range numbers. But of course, that's a really politically um, unpopular uh, thing to do. So, so we're getting a lot of pushback from that. Okay, so a little bit about, so we're seeing all of these, these range impacts, all these impacts to Navajo lands, um, mostly from overgrazing, but also things like um, invasive species, development, uh, legacy of uranium mining, um, all sorts of stressors out there. Um, and so because we're focused on um, wildlife on, on Navajo lands, both for T and E species, but also for, for big game species, so for deer, elk, pronghorn, um, all sorts of things also. Um, we thought that was, you know, maybe we should shift away from just focusing on T and E plants and, and get sort of a restoration program going. Um, and so this is the Diné Native, Native Plants Program that started in 2017. Um, and the mission of the program is to serve as a living library of native plants for restoration, conservation, and research, and to provide the Diné people access to locally sourced native plants. So a really cool program. Um, and, and we thought that the, you know, the Navajo Nation has some really unique needs, which makes a tribally run native plants program um, all the more important. Um, and so you have, you know, this legacy of, of mismanagement of natural resources. So a long history of overgrazing. Um, and then something that we kept seeing again and again is really Navajo Nation um, kept remain, you know, remaining a gap in ecological resource and research and restoration. So this was, you know, there's a lot of groups doing restoration and research kind of in Arizona and New Mexico outside of Navajo lands, um, but, but not so much uh, within the, the reservation itself. Um, so we thought, you know, there, there really was a gap there that needed to be filled. Um, and then also a tribally run native plants program makes sense because um, it's probably the best way to, to honor the unique relationship between Diné people and plants. So you've got uh, this whole history of uh, traditional uses of plants that really needed to be incorporated in, in a plants program. And then, you know, it was really hard if you were doing any restoration on Navajo to get locally sourced native plant, plant material. Okay, so, so when we started this program, we were, we were like, oh, this sounds like a good idea. Um, but really, we didn't we didn't know how feasible this idea was. So we wanted to know like who's out there using native plants, how how uh, you know what is the need really out there, um, and so we, we were like, okay, we'll just do a survey and a, an assessment. Um, and so we basically focused our survey on two different types of people. Um, so we we talked to community members as well as Navajo Nation agency personnel. Um, and so uh, we went out to 22 chapters across Navajo, talked to 225 community members, and then 46 Navajo and, and affiliated agencies. So we did quite a bit of survey, survey work for, for this project. <clears throat> okay, so what, did we, what was the feedback? Um, and so from agencies, we saw a really positive response. So, you know, over 80% said that they would anticipate needing native plants in the next five to 10 years. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people recognize 63% said that, yeah, I think we should be using, you know, there is a need uh, in the ecological restoration side of things. Um, but then, you know, it was really surprising too, cultural purposes was, was 48%. Um, so there is that, that side of, of the plants program that's really important. Um, and then, you know, just so we could figure out which plants to focus on, we asked people what were the most common native plants that, that they anticipated needing in the future. Um, and so we've got our top five forbs, grasses, and shrubs from this survey. So that was really helpful for us. And then really cool, like 95% of community members personally use native plants, uh, which is super high. Um, and then we got over 59 
specific species that were recorded as being used. So a lot of people using native plants, a lot of different species being used. Um, and then these were the most common, um, most common, common native plants were Navajo tea, sagebrush, juniper, yucca, pinion, wild onion, sumac, tobacco, wild parsley, and osha. Um, and then, you know, people, people in their communities are really recognizing the need uh, for, for using native plants for, to address uh, really specific environmental needs. So really high percentage saw the need for range improvement, uh, erosion control, wildlife habitat improvement, and all sorts of things. So, you know, a ton of community support for, for this project. Cool. And so what we did was we took our responses from both communities and agencies, and we put all those together, and, and that became our priority species list. So these are plants that we focused a lot of our restoration efforts on. Okay, so, so what does the Dedant Native Plants Program do? Um, and so, first of all, we are a seed bank. So we're going across Navajo, we're collecting seeds from, from across the nation, and we're collecting a bunch of data along with, with those collections so that you know, we know exactly where all the seeds are, are coming from, we know associated species and all sorts of things um, so that our seed is source identified. Um, and then, so the intention behind the seed bank is not really to be like a long-term, like, you know, 50 year seed bank. It's really so that we have seed available for current and future restoration projects. Um, so we wanna be using seed and putting it back out there on the land. Um, and then I'll talk a tiny bit about seed transfer zones. So basically, um, so we know that seed is locally adapted to, to its home climate. Um, and so a way that, that the Diné Native Plants Program has been thinking about how to, how to keep plants that have that local adaptation um, and use them in the right places is by using uh, this level four uh, EPA ecoregion um, method. And so basically, you know, Navajo Nation has 21 ecoregions. So places within this ecoregion have similar climates, plant communities, elevations. Um, so conditions that are similar, basically. So if you were going to do a restoration project in Eastern Agency, uh, you would ideally be using seed that was also collected in that ecoregion. So that's kind of how we, we've been thinking about local adaptation. Okay, something really cool we've been working on recently is, is to actually do some seed increase. Um, and we've been working with some local uh, native farmers to do that. Um, so basically, we've got two, two seed fields set up, one in loop at like a lower elevation and, and then one at a higher elevation in Ganado. Um, and so seed increases are really cool. It's, they're ways to, to take a really small collection from the wild. So maybe you have only a little bit of seed from, from the Navajo Nation and you want to create like a really large amount of seed. Um, so one way to do that is to, to take that seed and grow it um, in an agricultural field. Um, and so we've been doing that. Um, and, then, and then what we can do is collect all the seed from our field um, and use that for restoration. Um, so we're focusing mostly on really common perennial grasses, uh, but we've also done a little bit of experimenting with, with some forbs too, like Penstemon and Navajo tea and uh, yeah, uh, white clover. Um, and so th those have been working out pretty well. So here's some here's some photos from our seed increase fields. Um, what's really cool about this this field too is because is um, it it becomes a really good teaching resource. Um, so we've done quite a few workshops out here where we have people come out and help us plant or come out and help us collect seed, um, and and so that that becomes really really cool and useful as well. Okay, and then we're actually doing, um, a, we're sort of pouring, you know, our first steps into doing um, ecological restoration. So really the whole point of collecting seed is so we can put it back out there and, and st start to restore some of these really degraded ecosystems. Um, and so we thought, you know, the, the, high, the really high need out there is really in riparian restoration. So we focused a lot of our, uh, Re restoration efforts into riparian areas. 
Um, and then, you know, it, it comes with, you know, wildlife habitat improvement because we know that riparian areas are really important for wildlife. Um, so we've done a project out in Sagi Canyon. And then this coming year, we've got a Chuska Mountain Stream restoration project as well. Okay, so this is some photos from the Sagi Canyon restoration site. Uh, so this is this is a, a canyon complex up in northern Arizona, kind of near like Cayenta area. I um, mean, you've got you know the tiny little postage stamp of Navajo National Monument, which is Park Service run, sort of nestled within this greater you know Navajo Nation land um, of Sagi Canyon. I um, mean, what's cool about this site is that uh, the the BIA as well as the outside consultant Fred Phillips. Uh, worked really hard and actually got a, a grazing management plan in place for this canyon. Um, so they had people sign um, in various, you know, for some of these side canyons, uh, sign like an, a, a deferment agreement. So they they were able to put up fences and keep cattle out of a lot of these side canyons. So that's really useful if you're planting plants out there, just to, to reduce, you know, all of the grazing pressure is, is super helpful. Um, and so, yeah, this this is the Wuji Bateau, um, and within within this canyon, there's a fence installed right now. So there's there's no cattle grazing at this site. Um, and then again, we use this as a teaching opportunity. So we took, oops, sorry, uh, we not sure how I did that. Okay, so we took we took groups out there there to actually do like hands-on restoration. Um, and we, we were able to collect and grow willow and cottonwood from the canyon um, and then you know grow it for, for a couple of months in our greenhouse and then plant it back on the site. Um, and then here we are, we're installing some, some erosion control structures too. So really cool project. Okay, and then this past year, we were really excited to actually hire a cultural plants coordinator. Um, so this is someone who's who's been working for a year, um, and they're they're going to try and and um, uh, develop the the cultural plants side of our program. Um, and so uh, what they've been doing, I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, so they worked really hard on a native plants handbook, um, and this this is a handbook resource intended for basically all Navajo land users. Um, so ranchers, grazing officials, farmers, um, all sorts of anyone, basically anyone looking to, to put native plants back on Navajo Nation lands. Um, and what's really cool about this, this handbook is that, you know, it goes through all the, all the ways that um, that seeding projects work on, um, on Navajo Nation, but it also has uh, this really cool description of, of really common um, successful restoration species that that will pretty much work um, anywhere across Navajo Nation. Um, so she's been working really hard on, on the handbook. Um, and then the, the full handbook is available on our website. Okay, and then she's also been talking to, uh, to traditional practitioners and medicine men um, to, to host these traditional uses of native plants workshops. Um, so this is a plants as wool dye workshop that we hosted um, in early December this year. And I'll actually play the video if it works. Um, it's a pretty cool workshop. Oh boy.
Awesome. Yeah, thanks for watching that. <laughs> Um, and then the other thing, we, so we've been doing quite a few uh, native plant workshops aimed at tribal land managers. So, you know, people from Department of Agriculture, um, Historic Preservation, BIA, um, people doing work, natural resource work on Navajo, um, and just get them involved in uh, some of the native plant propagation techniques, uh, native plant ID, and then seed collecting. Um, and then we take we've taken people out to to you know near nearby groups. This is a field tour to Hopi, which is a, a reservation right that's actually inside of Navajo Nation. Um, and so here we are looking at some erosion uh, structures that were installed on Hopi by the Hopi Rain Catcher Group. Um, and then we've talked a lot with tribal youth, uh, mostly through the ancestral lands program. Um, which is a, a tribal program under the Southwest Conservation Corps. Um, and so basically they'll have uh, tribal youth do conservation work like trail work, invasive species removal, um, things like that on, on tribal lands. Um, and so we've done some, some botany ID workshops with them. And then I'll end on the, um, this really cool 2019 herbarium collection workshop. Um, and this was cool because it, it involved uh, some of the colleges in Colorado. Uh, so we worked with Fort Lewis College as well as uh, University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and this was a four day uh, hands on herbarium uh, collection workshop. Uh, actually, Arnold Clif Clifford was there as well. Um, and it, we had 20 students from five colleges and six instructors. Um, so it was a really cool field opportunity. Uh, for, for a bunch of different um, colleges. Awesome. And that is all I have. <laughs> and hopefully I'm not out of time. That was kind of long. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, let me know. Hello, Nora. <laughs> uh, this is Bryce with IT. Can you hear me? Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so one question from the chat is, do you water transplants during restoration? Just once that planting, or do you have a way to provide water until once they're established? Yeah, great question. And it's, so yes, we, we do. Um, so we've got like a, a portable water tank um, on a, 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 like an ATV system. So you can go back and rewater, but it takes a ton of, of work. So more importantly um, is just planning your restoration timing. So that like, so a lot of our activities will happen like during monsoon, monsoon season um, so that you have hopefully moisture depending on the season um, so that plants can establish and that you don't actually have to go out um, and water. So that's the easier way to do it. <laughs> um, awesome. So the next question is, uh, is the video available to watch later about the dying of native plants? Yeah, definitely. So um, I can, I, I think it's on our website. Um, and I can type in the, the uh, website link. Um, or, and it's definitely on our Facebook page as well. Uh, so, so maybe you could type it. Yeah, I can do that after. <laughs> um, let's see. So another couple of questions here. So Carl Horak says, I've been working from W. Matthews 1886 list of plant names, is there something more current? Um, I'm not sure, is that the is that a list for Navajo Nation? I'm not, I'm, I'm not familiar with that list. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, let's see, so here's another question. Does the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project have a reclamation plan to follow the Navajo Nation Restoration Handbook? They do actually. So they have specific seeding lists for specific areas. Um, and I think they actually have a cultural plants seeding list as well. Um, so yeah, they, they actually, they have, well, first of all, they're following BLM reclamation um, standards, but they also have a Navajo specific seeding list for, for that, that Gallup water supply project. So that, that one actually is, has a pretty robust restoration plan. The next question, do you know of any similar programs with 
um, native teeny, so threatened and endangered plants on Pueblo or tribal lands in New Mexico? Yeah, I think uh, Pueblo uh, Laguna has a tribal native plants program. Um, and I haven't, I, we were gonna go out there and do a field trip, but then that was right before COVID. So we never, we never actually got out there. Um, but yeah, I would like, they were, they've been around, I think longer than we have. So for, for at least a few years before us. Um, that's the only one I know off the top of my head, unless you guys know. I was just curious about the guy. Um, that was pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Uh, it looked like all of those dyes were native to the Navajo Nation, except yep. the walnut. The walnut doesn't grow there. The walnut does, actually. Yeah. So there's um, there's a few pockets of black walnut. Yeah, is on it Navajo. Not, is, it, is it the Arizona walnut, the native from Southern Arizona, or is it an introduced? <clears throat> I think it's introduced. Okay. They're, they're not native to the reservation area. Right. Huh. And, we actually attended that class. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I missed it. There's so. A double. so you probably know more than it. I believe in burnt corn or white ruins. She uses about 880 different plant species for biotin. Oh. Wow. So she's a really good resource to have. But that probably wasn't traditional Navajo use then before white man came and introduced black walnut, right? That's something that. They learned to use later. Yeah, I think the, the guys were pretty much around for a number of years until the Fort Sumner, where they brought in the Vandalin guys. We have like the, the blues and the red. And most of the, uh, the dyes are pretty much uh, like natural colored, like naturally colored, like pastel colors. Hmm. So, interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting combo too, the ochre. It was like ochre sumac and pinion pitch or something. You have to use a, like different types of uh, hornets. You can use like the ochre, the pinion pitch, you can use like sumac, you can use like cheese berries, or else you can use like uh, anything that's like copper base or iron base and like aluminum silicates. Hmm. Like, you know, like copper, it, it, it comes with like different uh, charges, like you know, plus two, plus three, and so forth. So in one 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 stage of uh, like in uh, like, like iron, you use it as a mortar. I mean, you might get a like a kind of like yellowish color, and then if you does you use like a plus three or something, you might get a like a brownish color, and then you use another like a uh, ion. Uh, so it's like, like using lime and iron. Yeah, they'll just they'll, 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 they'll come out uh, greenish color. Um, <laughs> And then it all depends also on the type, type, the time of year that you collect these plants. Like there's a Roman hydrocephalus. If you get the, the tubers of it, the, the, the roots of it, if you collect them like in the spring, they're a little bit more of a yellowish color. And later on, the, they, they tend to get like more of a brownish orange color, like in like August and later on in the season. <laughs> Are they picking that up, the, the zoomers from in here? Arnold? I'm not sure. But they didn't get a conference mic, so it picks up some. Yeah, some I'm going to uh, uh, March the first, Christmas uh, the fourth. I have uh, three lectures that I'm going to do at in Manhattan, New York City. No. It's all them deals, uh, no native dyes and no weed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I used to teach that when I was. No, in the college. The guy. Yeah. It's like a science. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. So any other questions from the room? We do have a couple more from the chat. Oh, just uh you showed us that handbook of uh oh yeah, yep. Yeah, that I was wondering about that. Uh the the quality assurance and quality control, how do you uh how do you go about making sure that the, the plant species are correct and you have the right names and the right Navajo names attached to them? Oh yeah, I think and I think you had corrected some of our Navajo yeah, names. Yeah, some, right? some of these are I was looking through that as uh because there's like you have a species in there called Sinistio Douglasite variety of Uh-huh. Uh, uh they, they they the Navajo name that they use was uh a mm -hmm. which is uh Sinistio Mosa Base, Sinistio Neo Mexicana. 
but the actual name of that is like a uh, Oh, okay. Which means uh, you, you would use the leaves to take off the garments when it's off of the, of the reddish uh, fruits of the pumpkin. Huh. So that's the actual name. Okay. Like, yeah, I think I think we had to use like a. Uh, Published literature for the those names, but they they could be wrong in the in the actual publication. Yeah, yeah. The reason why I, I brought this up is because long term, like long terms, like uh, when when people get access to the material, like this is yeah, is uh they they learn the mis misidentification. They, they also learn the incorrect words or the names of those particular species. Yeah, and that carries on for a long time, you know, and it's hard to undo like in their mind. And when you talk to them in public, then you know they'll start arguing. It's so, oh no, I got it from the source. <laughs> yeah. So <it's>, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to feel free to look at this and, and yeah. give us feedback, because we can uh, we can make edits. I got a copy. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, any correction, send us. Mm -hmm. well, happy to know, do edits. I really like your approach and like what you guys are all doing, how you're getting more like uh becoming more like getting the Public, the public involved. Yeah, yeah. Bringing that knowledge back to the people. Yeah. Bringing that knowledge back to the youth. Mm -hmm. And you know, body was uh, something that was very widespread. Uh, that was known among like many, many different people. And right now, we we kind of uh, uh liberated that knowledge to like medicine men and herbalists. You know? mm -hmm. And like every grandmother had knowledge about plants. So it's good to get back to that stage where we get more people involved. Yeah, I think as we were planning this program, the more we we're like, oh, actually, it's the education piece that's really the most important. You think it would be like, oh, putting plants back out there, but um, yeah, the more we do this, the more we're like, oh, it's just talking to people and, and getting them outside. And um, yeah. <laughs> One other thing is like, uh, how did you get permission from Woody Gray Eyes or Oh yeah, he he's been an issue. <laughs> <laughs> we have not gotten permission from him. 2001, 2000. <laughs> There's a few holdouts in Sagi yeah. Canyon that will not do any fencing or he chased me up four times. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've been chased out. <laughs> well, 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 over my head. Oh, wow. oh, that's fun. <laughs> so I was kind of surprised that you had Sagi Canyon there in your photo. Part, parts of it are fence, <laughs> parts are not fence. <laughs> Yeah, and so here's a question kind of on that note. Uh, how do you protect your seedlings of cottonwoods, et cetera, from grazing? Yeah, that's a good question. So so in the Sagi Canyon site, that, that area is fenced, so so we don't need to protect those um, directly. But otherwise, like if you're going in an area outside of, of that that's not fenced, um, you can use these little like tree protector things. So that you actually like will plant your your pole and then the tree protector goes over the top of it and they're like really long. Some of them are like up to here. And so in theory, you know, the plant eventually will grow like above the tree protector. And then at that point you take it off um, just to keep it, you know, like a temporary protection from both, I think both cattle and like deer and elk and um, anything that's gonna munch it. Uh, one thing is, uh... You ought to get a whole bunch of bots to get out there and start looking, looking for that uh, yellow lady slipper. Oh, yeah. I know that's an extirpated one, but that, I. That has been seen since the 1940s. Yep. Yeah, yeah near Sawmill. Yeah. Have you seen it? I've, I've looked all over. <laughs> okay, so you've looked too. Yeah. Yeah, that one might just not be there anymore. It's, uh, not the sawmill, it's sawmill. Uh -huh. It's the old sawmill that's uh, west of uh, 12 meters. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, so that it just could be gone, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to it's hard to say. Like, yes, the species is definitely gone because it's like, have you looked everywhere at every every season? You know. I know one but, population in um, along the North River. Mm -hmm. Not at all. So very huh. dry before you get the storm. Mm -hmm. So there's a population of yellow <clears throat> there as well. Cool. Any other questions yeah. from? audience members. We have one other from the chat. It's a short one. What's the Latin name of the Navajo tea plant? Oh yeah, uh, Thelosperma subnudum, um, or there's a Hopi tea too that's uh, Megapotanicum, um, but Thelosperma 
this is Legina. Awesome. Any other questions? Well, let's give another round of applause to Moana. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. And this talk will be recorded and available online. So if you do want to watch it again or share it with anyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I just thank you all. Thank you, Nora. Yeah, thanks for coming out.